So going into this week's edition of SmackDown, I really had zero expectations with this SmackDown, you know, mainly because it was a Christmas edition, it was taped ahead of time, and, you know, during the holiday season, like Christmas, the writing team are obviously going to phone it in. I mean, really, who can blame them? They're not going to put too much effort into this show because it's the holiday season, they had two shows to write when they were taping, and let's face it, when it's the Christmas holiday season, really all you want to do is get home from your job and go spend time with your family. And let's face it, these writers and the job they do, even though we may not think they do that great of a job, they're still doing it 52 weeks a year. They're still having to write 52 editions of Raw and 52 editions of SmackDown a year. So you can't blame them for phoning it in at least a couple of times a year, especially when it comes to Christmas. So really, I had no expectations for this SmackDown. I didn't really think the show was going to be that good. Don't expect a great detailed review from me because if the writing team are going to phone it in over Christmas, I kind of feel like phoning it in over Christmas too, so who can fucking blame me? So on last week's edition of SmackDown, we had Biggie Langston finishing the show on top, which was nice. And then on SmackDown, he actually made a big difference in the main event on Raw by providing the, you know, the difference maker with the interference, etc. So it's good that WWE are actually giving Biggie Langston a bit of time in the main event. They did this a little bit last year when he was when he was with Dolph Ziggler and you know he was standing over Cena and it kind of dwindled a little bit. And now they're sort of back on the Biggie Langston horse. And you know it's good to see that. It's good to see WWE focusing on some new stars and putting them in positions which usually would be reserved for Orton, Cena, CM Punk, etc. And we open this week's edition of SmackDown with Cena saying, "This is the last SmackDown of the year," and blah 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 this and blah 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 that. Really wasn't paying too much attention. The Shield hit the ring. Uh, beating down Cena, we have Henry coming out to take them out, but he fails. Then Biggie Langston comes out and makes the difference once again. I don't understand why Biggie Langston and Mark Henry didn't come out together as they are a tag team and they are friends, but I guess that's what WWE just felt like giving us in this opening segment. Then we had Kane coming out, setting up three matches for the night, and I'm thinking, all right, so Kane actually does have some power when Triple H isn't there. Uh, he sets up Henry versus Reigns, Langston versus Ambrose, and Cena versus Rollins. So at least, if anything, from this opening segment, we got three announced matches for the night, which is always a good thing to know exactly what we're going to be seeing on the shows as soon as we tune in. So as you can imagine, with this being the Christmas period, and also with the Royal Rumble coming up, which generally doesn't have too many storylines built into it, this show had a quite large... Amount of filler, which I'm just going to cover in one segment because I don't see the point of doing it in separate segments. Wyatt Family versus The Usos. The Wyatt Family won very quickly. You know, I was quite surprised as to how much the Wyatt Family just destroyed The Usos during this match. It took like two minutes, three minutes, and then they destroyed The Usos after the match. You know, I get trying to make these guys look like a force, but The Usos are one of the more legitimate tag teams you have in the tag team division right now. So at least have a competitive match. Not to mention we've seen this match many, many times now, but... Whatever, it puts the wife on the over. Okay, Cody Rhodes versus Cesaro. Now, again, this is another really short match. You know, Cesaro gets the win. I guess with Goldust getting the win over Swagger and last week's main event, which they actually gave us a video package for, I guess this is now a feud. They'll probably feud going into Royal Rumble. You know, I don't know. I really don't know. PT Piers versus Ryback and Axel. Didn't care. Don't care about Ryback and Axel. I guess one positive that came from this was the fact that Titus O'Neil wasn't puking. And we didn't get the old, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna puke! He's gonna puke! That's right, he's gonna puke! At least we didn't get none of that shit. And how the hell does Ryback go from being in main events of pay-per-views to losing to the primetime players? I don't get it. This is why WWE, and I'm gonna cover this on my NXT review tomorrow, by the way. This is why WWE can never make any new stars. Because they seem to get to the top, and then they work their way back to the bottom. And it's just like... The only people that don't ever seem to do that are CM Punk and John Cena and maybe Randy Orton and, of course, Triple H as well. Never, never, you'd never see him losing to the primetime players, people. Just another reason why WWE can't make any new stars. Uh, Randy Orton versus Dolph Ziggler, because huh, we've never seen this one before, people. I think this is the first time we've seen it with Orton as heel and Dolph Ziggler as face, but still, we've seen this match many times. And, you know, when, when I see this match, this is a really competitive match. Um, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying... And Dolph Ziggler has just lost to Fandango on a pre-show in about five minutes. Why the hell is this match going on so long when Randy Orton is the form, is the actual you know WWE World Heavyweight Champion now? Why is this match going on longer than Dolph Ziggler versus Fandango? What the fuck is Dolph Ziggler doing with pink stuff in his hair? Is this another 
cure the cancer thing. That I don't know, but why is he putting pink stuff in his hair? I don't get it. And, you know, I understand the post-match attack was to kind of play up the fact that Orton could be a killer. And, you know, he did, you know, he did beat John Cena clean at TLC. So Randy Orton is technically now classed as a killer because he can beat John Cena. He can beat Superman. Uh, he could be a villain, actually, considering that. But, yeah, Orton versus Ziggler. I didn't get out of this match. Was I understand, you know, trying to have Dolph Ziggler have a competitive match with Orton, you know, but with the booking that has came before it, he shouldn't be having a competitive match with Orton. Really, with Dolph Ziggler being the way he is right now in the doghouse, Orton should be squashing him. He didn't really even need to have these guys have a match. He could have had Randy Orton attack Dolph Ziggler before the match and do the whole post-match attack. Didn't even really need to have a match, really. Daniel Bryan versus Damian Sandow. Now, my first two thoughts were, one, why are these two facing off? And number two... Why isn't Daniel Bryan selling any of the injuries from last week, which they just showed in a video package before the Wyatt family match, of the Wyatt family throwing him off a massive ledge? Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I just got thrown off a massive ledge, I wouldn't be able to go out there and wrestle the following week, would I? I'd probably be out to New Year. You know, Daniel Bryan gets the win, but I don't understand why Daniel Bryan is even on this show. I actually thought the best thing about the Wyatt family segment was the fact that Daniel Bryan didn't show up to make the save as is generally happens in WWE. Why are WWE not making Daniel Bryan sell these injuries? You know, I, I don't get it. All this filler on this SmackDown, again, I, I skipped through a lot of these matches. I really didn't care. So, yeah. So we had this whole triple main event thing. We actually had all six people out of the ring uh, for the last sort of 40 minutes or so minutes of the or half an hour of the show. Your first match you had was Langston versus Dean Ambrose, which... Langston wins, of course. You know, Dean Ambrose really hasn't been getting the good end of the stick lately. So Langston winning here didn't really surprise me too much. Plus, he's on a bit of a roll. You have to have him win. Reigns versus Henry was next. You know, again, I think having Reigns winning via the spear here was a good decision. You're trying your best to put over Reigns as this monster. Having him beat the world's strongest man with his spear helps not only put him over, but put that finisher over as a finisher that can finish off just about anyone. And then in our main event, we had John Cena versus Rollins. And I was thinking, hmm, I wonder who's going to win this one, people? Seth Rollins or John Cena? Vote now on the WWE app. Ah, hmm. You know, I can take it. I'll give it to Cena, though. This is a pretty decent match. It got a lot of time. It got more time than I really felt it merited, especially with it being Rollins. If it was Reigns, I would say, you know, it could go a good 15 minutes. With Rollins, I was thinking five, ten minutes maybe, but... When Cena is in the ring with the right person, he can put on a pretty good match. And, you know, Seth Rollins or Tyler Black or whatever you want to call him, he's a good guy in the ring. He can carry a match. He knows what he's doing in the ring. So you put him in there with John Cena, you can put him on, you can put in some good match. And this match made Rollins look good. You know, he's having a good competitive match with John Cena. But at the end of the day, it's still the same old John Cena with the same old quick whoop, whoop, finish, really, isn't it? So at the same time... Like, you know, it's putting Seth Rollins over, okay. But at the same time, it's just John Cena. Again, it's ending the year just as we've ended and started many, many years with John Cena AAing a heel to win a match. You know, and also it looked like Dean Ambrose took a real hard shot to the mouth when Henry Chuck Reigns over the announce table. Oh, he was bleeding from that horrifice. My God. So I guess how highly or lowly you rate this show really depends on how you value wrestling over storyline continuance and storylines and drama now. I'm more of a person about storylines and drama, so for me, this show wasn't exactly great, and I didn't really care too much about the show at all. But if you value wrestling with like not too much meaning, I mean, you had Orton versus Ziggler, which is a pretty decent match, in my opinion. The main event was a pretty decent match. There's a couple of us, of us scattered there all over the place. So if you enjoy wrestling just for the sake of wrestling, you will probably get a decent kick out of this show, if anything more. But if you want storylines and drama and stuff like that to keep you watching, this SmackDown really wasn't for you. And like I said, the writers would have phoned it in you know, this Christmas. Who can really blame them? So like I said, I didn't really care for this week's edition of SmackDown really all that much, which is why in instead I'm going to talk about something that I know a lot of you actually will care about, and that is the fact that Batista is going to be returning to WWE on January the 12th. We've seen the video vignettes that they've been doing with the animal returning. And you know what? I'm surprised they didn't announce him for the Rumble. I'm surprised they didn't announce him as an entrance to the Royal Rumble rather than on the January 20th edition of Raw. It's just... 
you know, felt a little weird to me, to be honest. And, you know, with a massive WrestleMania coming up, WrestleMania 30, an iconic WrestleMania, and WWE lacking in star power, it doesn't surprise me all that much that WWE have tried to secure Batista, who was previously a big star for them, and has done some movies and has achieved a little bit of mainstream success and can actually maybe do something, you know, for WWE in the sense that he is some kind of mainstream star. I guess the big thing for me is that I'm not particularly too... I'm not going, yes, Batista's coming back, brilliant. I'm not exactly like that about Batista. I guess the way I see it is I'm most interested in, you know, what they're going to do with him. What sort of big... I imagine he's coming back to be in a big match at WrestleMania to help the buy rate out because they're not going to have The Rock this year. You know, so I guess he's there to do that. And I just wonder what big match they're going to have for him at WrestleMania. And if indeed he is wrestling, of course, we don't really know if he's going to be wrestling yet. I don't know the terms of his contract. I haven't been reading the dirt sheets about this stuff. But it'll be interesting. Let me know your thoughts on Batista returning and who you feel he will face at WrestleMania the 30 this year. Maybe it'll become more apparent on the January 20th or just after the Royal Rumble. We don't know. But give me your thoughts and comments in the comment section below, please. I believe this is... Probably the most interesting thing that's happened this week. I'm not sure as how SmackDown wasn't. Have a good Christmas. I hope you had a good Christmas, guys. And also, have a good New Year. Make sure you check out my NXT review tomorrow, which is going to include some sort of unique you know, segments on it than what I would usually do in an NXT review.